This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. And by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Welcome to Epicenter. Uh, I'm Sunny Agarwal. And I am Friederike Ernst. And today we are talking with uh, Rune Christensen of MakerDAO and talking about many of the exciting developments and things that have been going on with DAI in the Ethereum ecosystem and, you know, about stable coins and the governance of the MakerDAO itself. So it's a really exciting episode. Uh, before that, though, uh, we have a couple of announcements, uh, many of them to do with the Berlin Blockchain Week. The first one has to do with uh, DAPCON. So uh, Frederica, given that Gnosis is one of the you know co-organizers of it, would you like to talk a little bit about that? DevCon is one of the conferences at Berlin Blockchain Week. Um, it starts August 21st and is until August August 23rd. And we have a 20% discount code for Epicenter listeners. Um, so the discount code is Epicenter DevCon 2019. Uh, no spaces. We will also record a second edition of Epicenter Live with uh, myself, Sunny and Sebastian, um, at uh, the DevCon conference. Um, the last one that we had at the Interchain Conversations was really nice. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of us will be attending at, you know, many different uh, events throughout the week uh, at Berlin Blockchain Week. I'll be there at the Better Cartel uh, demo day, as well as the Web3 Summit and ETH Berlin. So, you know, we it, I think it's going to be a really exciting week. Uh, so I, I um, encourage many people to show up and we'll actually be having our own uh, epicenter event during that week as well, where we'll be having a small meetup. Uh, similar to the one that we've had a couple of times at, you know, DevCon 4 and at ECC. Uh, it'll be a drink speed up with the hosts uh, and other listeners. It'll be on Thursday, August 22nd. Uh, the location is still uh, to be determined, but it will be pretty close to uh, the location where DapCon is. So, uh, you know, it'll just be a quick uh, walk over from the, from the venue over to the meetup location that day. Finally, uh, the last announcement I have, uh, is not for Berlin Blockchain Week, but for SF Blockchain Week, which is quite a bit further out uh, near the end of October. But the CESC conference, Crypto Economics and Security Conference, that's uh, basically it's the UC Berkeley uh, Academic Con Blockchain Conference, the one with uh, Blockchain at Berkeley throws annually. Uh, we're currently uh, accepting papers for submission. And so uh, if you just go to cesc.io, uh, from that site, you'll be able to find the link for how to submit papers. And so, you know, we're open to uh, papers on, you know, any topic with in the field of crypto economics or uh, systems design, uh, game theory. And so we encur I encourage as many people to uh, participate as possible. I'm going to be on, I'm on the program committee, so I look forward to reading all of y'all's papers. So without further ado, uh, we'll go to the interview with Roon. Welcome uh, back to Epicenter, and today we have on with us uh, a guest, Rune Christensen, who is the CEO of the Maker Foundation and the founder of the MakerDAO uh, protocol. And so many people are, you know, probably pretty familiar with uh, MakerDAO, especially, you know, it's probably one of the most popular uh, products uh, on the Ethereum uh, ecosystem uh, with the DAI stablecoin. And... So Rune has been on the uh, episode uh, once before, uh, all the way back in 2016, uh, before Dai had even launched. And, you know, since then, Dai has, you know, grown to become this massive project that has become, you know, very successful. And so, you know, we thought it was time to bring uh, Rune back on the shore to talk a little bit about how the project has um, changed and uh, what's, what's new and how this uh, massive surge in adoption has gone. So uh, welcome back onto the show, Rune. Uh, can you give yourself, can you give uh, the listeners a little bit of uh, an intro about yourself in case, uh, you know, some of them may have not seen the last episode, given that it was all the way back in 2016? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me back here. 
it's pretty wild <laughs> to sort of look back three years in time in the crypto space. Um, so this is a very interesting opportunity, I think. And just quickly about myself. So basically, I I did a lot of attempts at startups when I was uh, younger and uh, worked a lot of like worked a long time in Asia. When I then discovered blockchain technology and first got into Bitcoin, got really into Bitcoin, you know, became like a real Bitcoin type back in 2011, 2012. But then over time, I discovered, uh, like, I, I got somewhat disillusioned by Bitcoin's volatility, really, and sort of the, the fact that it wasn't seeing less kind of the mainstream adoption that people predicted initially. And I think to a large extent, that was because of the volatility, right? And because it's not, it's more useful as gold rather than uh, regular currency. So I got into stable coins and I discovered. BitShares, which was the first decentralized stablecoin project. But unfortunately, due to many reasons, BitShares never really gained the kind of traction that we hoped for. And instead, me and a couple of other people from the BitShares community eventually pretty much switched over to Ethereum and, and kind of took the stablecoin component from BitShares and tried to implement it on Ethereum. So were you actively involved with like the development of BitShares? No, you could say I was a very active community member. And it was, I mean, many of these like fundamental ideas around MakerDAO all come straight from, from the bitch, like from the idea of bit shares. In particular, right, how like you have regular community members ultimately being, like despite not being sort of an official developer of the project, right, I still was very deeply involved in sort of the core of the governance of it, which is exactly what was so pow- I mean, what is so powerful about blockchain technologies, right, and blockchain entities. So the uh, BitShares system, uh, you know, they used uh, their, their contract for difference uh, system. You know, can you g- tell us a little bit about some of the things that why BitShares, you know, maybe didn't work and how that kind of contributed to your design of uh, the maker system with the CDPs? Yeah, so there's really a couple of, of reasons. I would say there's, there's really three major reasons why, like, I mean, there's three major things that, to some extent, got in BitShares way, right? So first of all, was that BitShares was this, it was not like Ethereum, a smart contract platform, rather it was kind of like a Swiss army knife. So so it's like a, a single platform or like a single project that tried to do many different things, right? So it both, it did stable coins, which was mainly, like was kind of its main product, right? And really the, the biggest innovation of the project. But it also did things like, privacy and like a very advanced privacy system and things like account names which at the time like instead of having the long strings like having actual account names was like very revolutionary and just like a whole range of other things like decentralized exchange um there was even like some music (laughs) related stuff uh which is i I think is funny it's like it's kind of related to what ended up happening with our chain many years later but i mean there's just there was a lot of it it tried to do a lot of things and as a result it didn't really like miss so well on, on any one specific product, at least within the very early, like big window of opportunity that it had back even before Ethereum launched. And then secondly, um, the, there were some fundamental problems with its stablecoin design still, chiefly that the stable coins were based on a single collateral type, right? So they were only collateralized by the BitShares asset itself. Uh, so actually similar to the current design of, of single collateral die. And the downside with that approach is that it really limits the level that the system can scale. Because once you get to a certain size, you kind of create the systemic risk where the stablecoin failing could take down the entire platform. And that's, of course, the, like that's the really big innovation that uh, we brought to the table in that we actually figured out how do you take this basic approach with a single collateral type and you actually design a system that has many different collateral types which can then diversify and and uh, really mitigate the risk that's a, so like that's inherent in having just a single collateral type and even branch out the use case way beyond what was originally envisioned um, in terms of like even accessing real world assets and all sorts of even more sort of futuristic stuff and then I think the final point that I think is also like has been really critical for our development and, and, and really a big part of, of uh, how Maker has evolved is that the BitShares community and sort of the BitShares philosophy was quite extreme in that it was really like 
hardcore anarchism in many ways and and really by to some extent totally detached from reality which then ended up just like you know turning off a lot of people who would otherwise have been interested in it but who simply were like turned off by like the the idea that if you want to use this super awesome technology you also have to like subscribe to all this ideology right which is not always uh in fact it's it's a pretty bad strategy for for trying to get business adoption so maker did start off like very much derived from that anarchist philosophy for sure but it was with the mindset that in the end the goal is to make change in the real world and and that perspective then led us on this like ability to essentially grow up alongside the rest of the ecosystem right because really today the the blockchain space is just very different from what it was even let's say back in 2016 yeah absolutely and we'll deep dive into how exactly the the um the stability mechanism works in a second but uh, just as a catch up can you can you give us the 90 second version of what happened since uh, we last had you on the show yeah i mean it i i think it is really mind blowing if you could go back to 2016 and then tell people what the landscape looks like today with like maker out in the wild and things like compound and other defi projects all working together but just the very basic milestones right is Obviously, the launch of Single Collateral Die, which was really, to some extent, the the first launch of like a like the first successful launch of a major DAP, um, and then followed immediately by the trial by fire as it had to survive a 95% crash in its collateral, right? Just starting immediately from its launch, and actually, Single Collateral Die was able to you know totally like brush us off, right? So there wasn't that complete crash in 2018 and. At no point in time did it in any way sort of come close to threaten the stability of DAI or threaten the integrity of the pig. So that really created this critical proof point that the technology did in fact worked, work in the way it was, was supposed to work, which then led to just this greater sense of, of trust in the system and ultimately adoption that followed with that, right? So um, in summer 2018, uh, the system hit its initial debt ceiling of 50 million and the governance had to actually raise it beyond that. And then it, it went all the way to about 80 million die in circulation, which is where it's, it sits today, as well as something like, uh, I think it's more than $300 million worth of Ethereum blocked as collateral in the system right now. And then what came next was the proliferation of the DeFi ecosystem, right? So this sprawling ecosystem of startups that could really be made by anyone, right? Like, And that can fit together seamlessly. And because they have DAI as their source of decentralized stability, they can actually provide very useful uh, products and very useful services without giving up uh, or sort of compromising on the decentralization, which is otherwise often what you see is the, uh, the trade-off with, for instance, uh, something, I mean, just with Bitcoin, for instance, right? A lot of the very interesting stuff you do with that or just other, other systems that, are, that, don't, uh, that aren't based around smart contracts, you very often have to give up decentralization to get more advanced functionality. And I think this might be the first time where we've seen this, like where we've seen the opposite, where we've actually seen that decentralization in fact adds to the functionality and adds to the convenience of using these apps because they all fit together seamlessly, right? Which is, I mean, it is really mind blowing, I think. And it's no, not many people think about that. Also because maybe many people didn't really, weren't around in, in let's say 2015, 2016 when Ethereum started. But, but it is pretty crazy that the ecosystem has actually been able to deliver on that promise of like this seamless interconnection between, you know, trustless and permissionless financial services. And then finally, I think this has been a little bit more than uh, 90 seconds now, but the final and, and perhaps the, mo well, in my opinion, the most critical milestone is that uh, the community was able to bootstrap the decentralized governance of the single collateral die protocol and actually begin controlling the system directly through the MKR tokens in a very active and uh, very, well, somewhat efficient manner, although with a few pitfalls here and there. But but that has really been, I mean, that is the most incredible thing of all, because of all the things, it is really the decentralized governance that, that um, kind of like defines the mega project the most. And it is the critical value proposition and the critical feature of the system that really makes it interesting because it 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 
promises to, to deliver something that's completely different from existing financial systems, right? That are all like incredibly locked down and and uh, with with this like inherent lack of transparency and, and very often contradicting incentives built into the system. I mean, that's also just one of the things that many people didn't believe it was even possible, right? Like, I mean, in fact, we didn't even really, I mean, we weren't really sure if it was even going to be possible to do it, right? <laughs> if you could actually launch a, like a like a sustainable financial system and then just let it be controlled by random strangers over the internet as long as they have the right incentives by holding the right token but but it has actually played out right and and nowadays we've reached a point where on a weekly basis the mkr holders actually manage the system actively this episode of epicenter is brought to you by cosmos the internet of blockchains Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. Can you explain to us how the system makes sure that one die is always one US dollar? So, I mean, just for just just for the larger picture, there are other stable tokens such as USDC and the Gemini dollar and Tether that are or are supposedly backed by uh, a dollar in the bank for each uh, one of these coins that are issued. So, die actually works differently in that it's uh, backed by crypto collateral. Um, so how does that work and how do you keep, how do you peg the value to the dollar? Yeah, very important question. There's kind of two mechanisms to it, right? There's, there's two sides to it. So there's the, there's the long-term uh, question of fundamental solvency and uh, I guess you can say resilience of the system, right? Which is like, can it, like, is it really, is the real value there behind the token or is it all just like hot air, right? And that's where the answer is. It comes from the on-chain collateralization, right? So the reason why you know that there's real value in your DAI is because you can go to the blockchain, you know, right now, go to mkr.tools, for instance, and you can actually, you know, on your own, do a f complete audit of every single aspect of the system uh, in real time even, right? And you can ensure that there's always this, le like there's always this fundamental and inherent solvency in the system, as well as a safe level of over collateralization so that despite the system right now being backed by only ETH uh, and the inherent volatility of ETH, this, it's still able to remain stable even in situations such as the 2018 crash because the, the, um, the risk parameters, so the kind of like the, the, the safety logic of the system that keeps it safe from things like crash, from a crash, right, uh, is set correctly so that you could have a, you know, you could have a significant fall in the price of ETH but that's fine because there's about five times as much value of ETH in the system as there is outstanding DAI in the market, right? So you could really, the system can handle a very big crash. So that's the, that's kind of like the long, you know, that's the fundamental like value in the system. That means that there's a potential here for, for sort of, for stability, right? But then the other question is how do you create short-term stability on one hand? So like, pegged price right that's like that stays at the same price point but even more importantly how do you create liquidity right so how do you make it possible to move large amounts of die into eth or into another stable coin or even cash it out for fiat and the answer is that it's it is like you said it's kind of the system keeps it stable but perhaps a better way to think of it is that it's the governance that keeps us that keeps it stable and that actually make, takes care of this because it is managed through uh, the like adjusting the rates in the system. So basically, the the, the cost of generating die primarily is how it it works right now. Um, in the future, it will also be the savings uh, rates, like the gains you get from holding die, um, 
but it's not going to be available until a future version. So right now it's actually purely done on the on the generating die side, uh, which is really it's similar to changing the cost of borrowing, let's say U.S. dollars, um, mm-hmm. which is exactly how the let's say the Federal Reserve, central banks in general, they maintain the value of their currencies. So what they do is they modify the interest rates, and as a result, they basically change how how likely it is someone in the market is going to borrow money which expands the supply right because when you borrow money in a fractional reserve system you you're essentially creating new money or or or, or do, will do the opposite right pay back their loans and actually just hold on to money if the interest rates are higher right so it's the same thing that the the maker system does and that governance controls is they modify what's called the stability fee which is the the fee that someone pays to essentially borrow die or generate die by uh, depositing collateral into the system and then utilizing the smart contract system to to essentially print new die and then the stability fee is the price you have to pay for this for this service and it's and that's what i was referring to that this is what's being actively changed like actively modified every single week right now by the decentralized governance This stability fee has gone up from, I think, initially something like 5 or 7% to currently over 20%. What do you make of that? So what what do you think uh, this means for the ecosystem? Not in terms of how expensive it is uh, to borrow money, but in terms of what does this say about the ecosystem? What has changed? What's the underlying metric that has changed? Yeah, it actually started at 0.5% when the system was launched. And the very like the very basic assumption that turned out to be wrong is that it the, the assumption was that there's going to be incredible demand for a decentralized stablecoin and which is kind of like the simple use case right and sort of the basic uh, value proposition of the maker protocol. And then this the secondary use case of generating dai, which is a much more advanced type of way to interact with the system right which is it's and it's similar to it's similar to borrowing money in the bank uh, or, or taking out a mortgage or even margin trading in some situations um, where you deposit collateral into the system and you generate die right and yeah it was just like I mean, first of all the interface to do this was incredibly complicated and it took about seven ethereum transactions to even have a cdp go through right uh, and it's, it was just also like it's a very advanced and completely cutting edge and a new type of, of service, right? Like the very first DeFi app and that had never, you know, before the term DeFi even existed, right? So we naturally assumed that it was going to be more difficult for people to do that part, whereas it would be easier to get them to use the, 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 the more simple and approachable stablecoin functionality. And this was also the case very in the, in the very beginning, but very quickly, uh, the, like the idea of, of DeFi, of being able to, in a decentralized system, actually uh, access uh, financing for your inventory and taking on decentralized margin positions was was like it was a very powerful idea, and it's essentially spread like wildfire with people teaching each other, I guess, how to do, how to use this, right? Uh, even in the very first stage where it was so difficult to use. So what ended up happening is that there were way more people interested in in using the advanced die generation functionality, right, to to borrow and borrow DAI and open CDPs um, than there are people using DAI initially. And then what the system does is, like, because what this affects, right, is like the, it's the supply and demand, right? So you have sort of the, the demand for DAI, which sits at some particular level, and then you have the, the supply of DAI, which which sits somewhere else. And they're, they're kind of independent of each other, as in people holding DAI are people who want to go out and, and use a stable coin, maybe spend it. People who open CDPs have a, have a different, a completely different uh, demand, right? They're interested in leverage. They're interested in financing. So the way you and what you have to, what has to happen is they have to meet exactly in the middle. So they have to be exactly the same because if they're not, the price won't be one dollar. So if, if let's say supply is higher and demand is lower, the price will be below a dollar. And if the, it's the other way around, the price will be above a dollar, right? And so what governance does fundamentally to kind of like tie them into sync is to adjust the stability fee. So it, so what that means is adjusting on the supply side, how look like how interesting, how um, how how yeah, just like the, the terms on which you can generate die, right? Because if the stability fee is higher, it costs way more to generate die, and less people are going to be interested in it. So that's why, and and that's then how you how we know that what happened is that there were 
tons of demand for generating DAI, right? Because the stability fee just shut up, which meant that without it, like if the stability fee had stayed the same, the system probably wouldn't be in sync today. It would probably be like there would be way more DAI outstanding, but also the price would be below $1. So why was the stability fee the only way to uh, modify the supply? I mean, in in a way, would it, shouldn't we expect that, you know, back when the uh, die price dipped to like, you know, 80 cents or something, shouldn't we expect that the difference from the shelling point of $1 should provide the CDP creators enough incentive to arbitrage that and, you know, maybe buy a bunch of die, close their CDPs, allow the system to go back up and then reopen the CDPs when the uh, die price is back to a dollar. Yeah, that, and that's the basic assumption of how at the very micro scale, the system remains stable, right? But the thing is that that assumption depends on the like another assumption, right? Which is that governance will actually act to deal with imbalance, right? And that's that's uh, of course in the early stages of the system. That's there's less proof that go the governance actually works, right? So the fact that the shelling point even is one dollar isn't really as established compared to you know after basically today, right? Where people are a lot more more willing to trust the fact that the price will go back to one dollar. Do you think part of the issue might be that the set of people who are able to participate in arbitrage? is limited where i you know i guess when i was first learning about die like it didn't it, it, i guess it didn't hit me and then when i was looking at it again like you know like a couple years ago it took me a while to realize that oh wait the die holders actually don't have any claims to underlying collateral assuming you know except in the case of uh triggering a global settlement but because it's not possible for the die holders to actually you know go against the like basically you know the only people who are able to arbitrage it are the cdp holders and they have to over collateralize so heavily and so that heavily limits the set of potential arbitragers thus making it a much more inefficient market what's actually being arbitraged and this is what's what's i mean this is the part that can be very difficult to to sort of wrap your head around right but it really is the cost of capital so it it's not a quick like because there is like there is no fundamental claim in any way to one dollar Unless in the situation as you described, the global settlement, right? Which is a very like niche edge case that isn't actually meant to even happen. My point is that even a CDP holder doesn't have some like direct way of saying, if I have one die, it sort of automatically unlocks one dollar value elsewhere. I mean, you could, it does of course apply on the actual liquidation ratio, sure, but it doesn't, like, I mean, in the end, it's a different concern compared to kind of like the risk management at the, at the larger scale, right? And in reality, what they're, what they're really looking at is the cost of capital. So what they're, they're interested in is how likely are they going, like, are they going to make more money if they hold on to the CDP and they hold on to the leveraged position of ETH, for instance, in there, and despite, and paying whatever cost they have to pay on the, both on the, um, you know, on the stability fee side, but also on whatever potential, uh, you know, uh, arbitrage gain there would be. And the thing is that in many cases, you know, the even if the arbitrage potential is huge, it might not actually outweigh the, the sort of imagined gain or like the projected gains of a CDP holder. So the, there's just so many dynamics playing into this where there's only one solution and that is very proficient management of the stability fee and the monetary policy of the system. But with that in place, they're actually like it should theoretically be exactly as efficient as the current monetary system is in this regard. But of course, with the extra benefit of also being even more seamless and blockchain based and so on. So to make it as efficient as the current monetary system, that would uh, make the claim that the MKR holders are as proficient at monetary policy as the, you know, the people at the Federal Reserve who are, you know, generally much, you know, trained economists and stuff. Two questions here. One, which is a, you know, question I've had for a long time, and I just unfortunately couldn't find any good resources uh, answering it on the internet, is how was MKR distributed? Because, you know, you, there was never any sort of ICO or anything done for MKR. Um, so yeah, kind of how does that distributed? What percentage of it is still in the hands of the foundation as well as uh, VCs or, and then what percentage of is in the hands of, you know, the wider public. And then two, how do we make sure that the people who are holding this MKR are necessarily 
the most sound monetary policy decision makers? So yes, this is really the fundamental question of the, the system, right? Because like I said earlier, the decentralized governance is the core feature. And uh, the I mean, the, the basic underlying assumption is that if you have a proper, like, open and, and um, like, equal playing field, I guess you can say, for the, the science and the knowledge related to monetary policy, you will always be able to beat any amount of experts, right? Because you will have the entire global body of knowledge participating directly in governance, which means that you could even have, let's say, central banks participating, potentially, right? And they would all have the exact same point of access and the exact same uh, framework to participate as well, every other central bank or every other commercial bank or every other like random econ nerd sitting in the basement and kind of like thinking about innovative new, you know, ideas around it, right? And the, the thing is that in the end, it's very hard to sort of say who is like, I mean, it's very hard to pick kind of like this, the, the genius person who knows how to like run the world economy, right? Because it's kind of, it's, it's, you know, global, like macroeconomics and, and monetary policy, it's, it's actually to some extent a bit similar to voodoo in that it's not totally like it's not you know it's like quite uh, fluid and it's quite to some extent an, an art form as well right so what that means is that it's not really guaranteed that kind of like the highly decorated ultra expert is the guy that will prevent the financial crisis from happening it could just as easily be someone who's just seen something that no one else saw because they all were locked in their old way of thinking or something like that right and the the core idea of the MakerDAO decentralized governance is that what we want to do is we want to create, um, I mean, what we really think of as, as something like something similar to a scientific community, right? Where there is a free, again, like a free playing field and free sort of open framework for all ideas to participate in a in like a like an unbiased forum, right? Where you can have a, like where every perspective gets a chance to participate, right? So whether it's the established central bank or the sort of the, the, new, the more radical and more modern or whatever new innovative approaches. Of course, there has to be like, I mean, there, once you sort of open that Pandora's box, there's so many questions there, such as moderation and like priority and so on, right? That needs to be considered. And in the end, and that's maybe also like a, like a critical other piece of it is that you have to, of course, you have to ground yourself in a conservative mindset, right? Because, of course, if you just go out and sort of do radical monetary policy, you very quickly end up looking like Venezuela or Turkey or something, right? Where people try to defy gravity, which, of course, you can't do, right? Yeah, like the basic answer really is that you could say that, it, like, even if the Fed had the world's top economists and uh, monetary policy gurus, they will still just be a subset of the people who will be able to participate and have direct line, like both have direct access and line of sight to make a governance, but also have that direct ability to actually influence the governance itself. This then comes back to the question of decentralized governance and MKR holders and how you actually implement this in practice, right? Because uh, like many people think that the sort of the basic idea of make a governance is just MKR holders just vote and decide whatever they want, right? They basically do whatever they want and that's the end. But it's actually a much more sophisticated framework where it's more it's more that MKR holders have this role of trying to surface the you know like the key rational points made in this scientific framework. And and only sort of by going for this rational approach and trying to reach something that's as objective and as as vetted as possible. Um, are you able to actually reach a shelling point where you can even get consensus around that direct approach? Before we dive into the governance, Sunny asked earlier, um, so how were the maker tokens actually distributed initially? So who are these people who actually hold maker? There was initially 1 million MKR tokens, right? Created by me, really, and, the, and a couple of other guys in the early days. And... Uh, we knew, like, we knew from the very beginning that because, again, like the MKR, hold, MKR token holders are not meant to kind of like run the system through a popularity contest, but they are of course very important in in that with the wrong set of stakeholders, you could have like you could easily see how the system could fail, right? So we knew very early on that it would be too risky to just do, for instance, an ICO and try to pump the token and then get a 
bunch of, of speculators in, right? But rather it's all about choosing the right set of stakeholders. So the very first approach was to, um, to distribute it directly to people who volunteered to work on the project, uh, contributing with uh, like with um, or like science or, or engineering um, or just like various forms of contributions to the project. And then also selling directly to, to some like uh, engaged community members that were kind of like essentially like a part of the early sort of the core engaged group, right? Which was very different from how an ICO operated because the early major project actually distinguished itself by sort of almost doing negative marketing, like Fight Club style. Like it was actually meant to kind of be a bit of a secret club where the right people needed to get some space to get their head around it before the the masses came in, I guess you could say, right? And of course, after a while, the system grew to a point where the community felt confident enough to kind of open up wider and, and make the project more widely known, uh, which actually coincided with then when I did those very early podcasts, including here on, on Epicenter, right? This came at the same time as like the increased scrutiny of the blockchain space, as well as new regulation and new kind of like uh, concerns around, you know, especially token distribution, right? So, so basically once, like once we reached that point, it became very clear to us uh, and, and uh, f- from the perspective of a legal strategy that the only reasonable way to distribute tokens like a token like MKI would be to sell it to like uh, essentially like um, you know like like established and uh, and just like the you know very very proficient institutional investors right so so in the US accredited investors for instance right and just in general the kind of like the kind of uh, of stakeholder where you can you could you could sell them a token and it could go totally poof and be worth nothing and everyone would be like that was your own fault right because you knew what you were getting into and you did your own research right and on the other hand if you actually try to again like if you try to sell to the masses and and things blow up it's a little bit different like there's a level of of trust there that's kind of expected to be to be maintained when you do that which is also where you, we saw the whole ICO craze go wrong right um but the biggest of the like the, the biggest event of, of of when we started this new approach of selling mkr to large uh, established stakeholders was of course when we uh, sold actually a total of six percent to andreessen horowitz which was among their very first uh, purchases of of um, digital assets and to this day is kind of like one of the absolute core pieces of their of their crypto portfolio that also really put the project on the map, right? Because it was a huge stamp of approval in the more established VC and like crypto world and even wider financial space or tech space to get Andreessen Horowitz buying into this project and also participating directly, right? Like um, in terms of, of uh, promoting it and, and sort of talking about the implications of the project and, and as well as supporting the foundation uh, in all sorts of, of activities we were doing. Um, so like, I mean, Today, it's basically a mix of kind of like early community contributors, early community uh, like buyers, like people who've bought on the secondary markets, especially in the early days. Um, there's particularly a lot of Chinese people who did who bought in like that. So there's a, actually a very significant Chinese community in the MakerDAO ecosystem. Um, and then there's a, a lot of these um, institutional um, stakeholders including Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the biggest, but then also actually a, a lot of, of other sort of smaller, like I guess you can say medium-sized institutional stakeholders. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft had you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. 
one click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. Before we dive into what exactly governance means in this instance and what um, MKR holders can actually do um, with um, their maker tokens, the stability fee that is generated currently still goes to maker holders, right? It doesn't go to the DAI holders, it goes exclusively to maker holders. What was the rationale behind that design, de behind that design decision when you made it? It's really the fundamental economic dynamic on the system that kind of makes the that makes it go around in a sense that it aligns incentives between the different participants in the system, right? So it really it's very basically that MKR holders they sit sort of at the I guess you can say they sit at the core of the system and they they fundamentally perform the governance function of the system, right? So they decide really how like the business logic of the system and what it's actually doing. So it includes like stabilizing the price of DAI and so on by levying a stability fee on CDP holders, uh, but also in the future, other more advanced functionality, such as also setting the, the DAI savings rate, uh, which and, and, and a whole range of other stuff, more advanced governance. Um, but most crucially, the thing that they, like they're, they're doing, right, is that they're setting the kind of like the risk parameters and sort of the logic around how do we keep the system safe from a crash, right? So how do we make sure that we don't put all our eggs in one basket so that we're only relying on, you know, a single cryptocurrency as collateral, even when we are at a scale of several billions, because that's when you really get that systemic risk, right? That could just see the whole thing wiped out. And also the ratios are set correctly so that, you know, like, I mean, you, you have the right amount of buffer, you know, um, in excess of a particular position the system where you've put in some collateral to generate die and you the MKR holders then make sure that when you do that the excess collateral that you put in is enough to cover the volatility of that asset right and if and then the and then the key aspect is that if they set this incorrectly right so if they fail to correctly protect the system from excess risk they have to absorb that excess risk so let's say that they allow a, a cryptocurrency that's not particularly good into the system as collateral and they allow it in with like a very small gap right so you can generate a lot of die from that cryptocurrency and it then just like goes poof right it's gone there's no money left then what you what you end up with is is bad debt right on Un, uncollateralized unbacked debt and in and without any other measure you actually have insolvency in that case right you actually have a situation where there's no longer uh, a guarantee that all dies backed by by uh, on-chain collateral right but then that's where the mkr token steps in uh, and and takes the loss essentially through an automatic like fully autonomous mechanism that what it does is it just starts printing mkr to raise funds so basically it prints mkr like automatic like the system detects that there is a loss right the text is a shortfall then it prints mkr and then it automatically sells it in the market to raise uh to to raise die from the market right to, to yeah basically um raise the same amount of die as there's a shortfall in the system and then it uses this the die that is raised to essentially cancel out the shortfall uh by by uh, burning the die like by removing the die from circulation so that it can kind of like have the two things equal out and make sure that now the amount of collateral that's in the system is is uh, congruent with the amount of die that's in circulation so is this lender of last resort functionality actually um, implemented on the current uh, live maker contracts? No. So in single collateral die, there's actually this additional mechanic called PEF. And um, all of this logic is implemented more on the, on the kind of like the, like the ETH CDP holder side. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a, I mean, it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's like, it's a functionality that, that sounds very complicated. When you explain it, which is like that, that this aspect of of the the forced dilution of um, kind of like the underwriter of the system sits with the people who also hold collateral in the system mm -hmm. in the event of a of a serious crash. So I guess my question is that in the moment in the single collateral die instance, 
Is there any risk that the MKR holders take on? Because currently, the lender of last resort uh, risk is passed on to the to the uh, CDP holders. So, what is the risk that the MKR holders are currently being rewarded for? Yeah, this is a very. I mean, this is a very common uh, concern. I guess you could say point made about the system, right? But if if you really think about it, then right now, as an MKR holder, you're taking more risk than you ever will, right? Because at this stage in the system's life cycle, there's a way larger probability that it will just completely and outright fail, right? And that's the big, like that's the big uh, additional dynamic of, of the MKR token today, right? That because you're acquiring MKR, that's I guess you'd say freshly made, right? Because the system is is brand new. There's a way bigger risk that you're not really, you know, you're just buying into an experiment, right? And not, and of course, it is by far the most established experiment on Ethereum, right? But Ethereum still is just, I mean, DeFi really is this still, like this thing that has yet to fully prove itself. So from that perspective, um, I mean, MKR holders really, I would, I mean, they still take by far the largest risk of anyone in the system, right? Because um, I would say that there's a bigger risk of MKR. I mean, it's a, like Ethereum as a whole is, is obviously better established than MKR, right? So the dyma- dynamics of the system itself still doesn't directly impose a loss on uh, on MKR holders, right? But of course, if you had the system wipe out, it would sort of, I guess, as a second order effect, also just wipe out the MKR token. Um, but I mean, the thing is that none of that really, it doesn't really matter that much, right? Because we're just talking about the very early stage and sort of microcosm of the system. And it's really, uh, you know, it's like, it's, yeah, it's like, it's kind of like initial uh, phase where it hasn't yet scaled, right? So these dynamics become a lot more important once we actually hit a larger scale where you have to, you know, where there also is a real job for MK holders to do in the, in the sense of doing proper risk management by diversifying different assets. So let's talk about uh, what the MKR holders, what, what the scope of their governance currently is. So there's a couple of parameters that can be set and reset in the system. Can you describe um, what they are and um, how, how this voting or casting a spell happens? Yeah, so I'll I won't explain all the parameters that can be modified by governance because there's actually a huge amount and the system is incredibly modular. But the the sort of standard risk parameters, right? So the standard things that MK holders they they um, they deal with in the current system is so there's the stability fee, right, which is the the cost of generating DAI from a CDP. Then there's the debt ceiling, which is the total amount of DAI that can be generated out of ETH. And then there's a liquidation ratio, which is the, the the sort of the buffer between debt and collateral you need to have in a CDP before the system liquidates your position. And uh, and so governance, really, I mean, it, the job of governance is to modify all of these. Primarily, obviously, it's the stability fee because that's how you stabilize the die market price in the wild. And then there's a debt ceiling, which is more like of a it's like a, a routine thing you do as the system grows. You kind of like evaluate the overall risk. Uh, to to allow it to to grow to a larger size, and you would still, I mean, you would very rarely see something like the liquidation ratio be adjusted in the in the wild in single collateral die because of the the significant um, direct effects it would have on on CDP holders who are actively holding a CDP who could have the effects effectively have the rug pulled out from under them, right? So so it would be it would be quite um, unlikely they would actually see the liquidation ratio changed. And then there's also some other, like some other more administrative things that that MK holders can do, such as um, changing the set of, of oracles, right, and choosing, picking the, the oracle providers. That hasn't happened yet, though. So the oracles that exist in the system today are the same oracles that it was launched with. Um, and then there's also another very critical functionality, which is emergency shutdown. So the ability to shut the system down in the face of some sort of, like, I mean. The, the main reason is you want to use that in the face of a crypto economic attack or perhaps a bug found in the system or some other significant problem or maybe even a run on the bank, um, which is where you then establish this direct ability to turn the die into underlying collateral. So h- how does the voting system itself work? Uh, if I'm a maker token holder, how do I participate in the governance? There's two aspects to that, right? So there is the on-chain uh, infrastructure, 
which is it's very simple. So it's basically a constantly it's like a vote that's constantly happening inside the smart contract called uh, the chief, where what the the governance participants do is they essentially you could say they stake um, they stake their MKR inside the chief. Although that's not really like it's better to think of it as they just participate in voting, and it's just like a technical uh, fact. Like it's a it's a technical detail that they actually move their MKR into the chief, but once they've done that, then the MKR is able to vote, and then they're actually able to essentially point their votes on any smart contract on the entire Ethereum blockchain. And the system then is constantly keeping track of wh- like which smart contract or which Ethereum address has the most votes, and uh, whichever has like this, the single address or smart contract that has the highest number of votes on the entire blockchain of, of all the votes in, that's, that's happening in the system is then given direct admin access into the core of single collateral die. So the way that you, um, for instance, modify the stability fee is that you, the way it works is that you, you have a smart contract that basically says target the, um, like, t- like it says, send a message to the core of single letter die that says, raise the stability fee by 2% or something, right? Or rather set the stability fee to 14% if that's what you want to do, right? And then once that smart contract gets the highest number of votes in the system, so it gets the admin access, then anyone can then go and poke it essentially, which is called casting the spell because it's like a technical term for this kind of of smart contract is spell, right? So what happens is uh, anyone is able to then just like trigger the, the proposal from like trigger the execution of the proposal and the transaction is then set into the system to modify the internal state of the system. So that's the, and, and that's the smart contract infrastructure, right? So then just very briefly, there's a layer on top of it, which is this user friendliness layer, right? And right now it's the, the foundation is the only one who maintains this kind of, of, um, of front end, but really what it is, is like a voting dashboard where you can like see different options for voting. And like, you can see, uh, different like there's even like both uh, there's both a polling system so sort of like a pre-vote and then there's the actual uh, like like um, system voting as well where you actually execute on on decisions made in the community and it's then presented through a, like an easy and secure interface that allows a larger amount of the of the community to participate cool what percentage of uh, makers typically uh, pointed at proposals that then become the front ru- front runner and become implemented so right now it's typically between 5 to 10% and you also have at uh, like uh, you have this important dynamic of around also 5 to 10% of people are always voting at um, at kind of like the current active proposal which then sets the bar as like you have to get at least, let's say, seven percent of the vote to be able to, um, to like uh, trigger a new proposal in the system and kind of like, it, it really acts as a quorum in that sense. You you said earlier that Andreessen holds six percent of the maker tokens, and there's a couple of other maker whales as well as well, right? So basically, it would it would only take one or two of those to actually force a proposal through, right? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, it's possible for someone to, in the current system, try to like pass a major proposal, right? And then the reaction or like the response to that would be to then trigger an emergency shutdown, right? And actually try to shut down the system from the from the crypto economic perspective, right? But the the challenge in the system right now is that whereas in in the multi collateral die, when the final version of the governance system is, is implemented right there's actually some incredibly strong game theoretic checks and balances in place that makes this kind of behavior even if you had let's say like anonymous actors holding let's say 50 percent of the tokens right or even like all the tokens uh well okay i mean just like significant amounts of the tokens right you still have just like like incredibly rigorous game theoretic systems in place that prevent anyone from actually acting maliciously in the system in the current in the current state of the system, rather the like a key defense comes from the fact that it's it's known to the foundation, for instance, who, like the uh, rather the foundation has been very careful in who it has sold to these like least large blocks to, right? And it's and it doesn't involve like a say a, a nation state actor, which 
could for some reason decide that they want to shut down the system right and and, and kind of like vandalize it rather it is just very rational economic actors that you know wouldn't wouldn't harm their themselves by by burning the system down but they like i mean it's that's always a dynamic of all decentralized systems right and all decentralized governance is that by the very nature of having the governance be fully decentralized and having the 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 sort of the final and the fundamental control of the system being available to a decentralized community you always have this element of like allowing people to shoot themselves in the foot if they want to the question always is what percentage of people actually have the clue to to shoot everyone in the foot uh, and one would wish that in a in a system uh, that that creates so much value and holds so much money would have to be more than five to ten percent. So, can you tell us um, what's going to change for the new governance model that that you talked about? Yeah, so it's really like so the way we that we saw this problem, right? It's really based on two uh, fundamental approaches, right? Like through two fundamental constructs. So the first is what's called the governance security module. So this idea that, or like this this uh, like a smart contract where it kind of sits between the voting system and then the core system itself as kind of a security um, buffer, right? A firewall in a way. And it, it works quite simply. It's that when you create a proposal and you execute a proposal in the voting side, it then passes into the governance security module and then sits there for some predetermined amount of time, which initially would likely be between 24 hours and up to a week. And then once it has sort of run its course in the governance security module, And, and been subject to the security delay, it then executes and enters the, the core system. And so you have this, this uh, approach combined with what's called the emergency shutdown module, so which is really just an upgrade of how emergency shutdown currently functions in the system. And what the emergency shutdown module does is it allows a much smaller, like it, it allows a fixed and, and quite small potentially uh, percentage of MKR holders to trigger an emergency shutdown. Which right now it's it's at, at launch it's going to be five percent, and so what that means is that any like any constellation in the community that's able to muster five percent of the total MKR supply will be able to counter a malicious proposal that's sitting in the governance security module, right? So so if someone tries to let's say uh, yeah just like burn down the system or steal all the collateral or somehow like try to harm the system, uh, then they will need to. You know, they will need to, first of all, let's say buy 51% of all the MKR, or maybe if there's only 15% voting, then 15% of the MKR, right? But some significant amount of MKR. And then um, they use that to trigger the proposal, but it then just goes into the governance security module. And in the meantime, the honest actors in the system can then essentially rally and, and uh, respond by triggering an emergency shutdown of the system. And what then happens is the system shuts down, right? It, it totally unwinds. Everyone is able to exit the position. At, at the technical blockchain level. But in practice, the way it plays out is that you immediately deploy a new system and then you provide a, what we call a smooth transition, right? So you, we provide this, this, what's really more like an upgrade process where you can transition from the old system that is now shut down and then to the new deployment as seamlessly as possible. And this is also how we, for instance, do the upgrade from single collateral die to multi collateral die, right? The point is obviously to make it as, as painless and as seamless as possible for the end user. But the really critical uh, game theoretical piece to this is that in the new deployment, because anyone is able to do a new deployment, right? It's, it's just an open, like you just deploy some open source code, right? But the community will uh, ultimately will, in most situations, reach consensus and kind of like uh, equilibrate towards a single successor deployment that then just becomes the new maker system. And this deployment could, in response to, for instance, a, an attacker just blatantly, blatantly trying to attack the system, right? Or steal the collateral or harm the system in some way and using a significant amount of MKR for that. In response to that attack, you can actually just burn their MKR on the new deployment. Like you can choose to what you call honor the MKR of everyone else, right? You can choose to kind of like let everyone else's MKR transition over. But obviously there's not really a good reason to allow a, a clearly malicious attacker who has voted to harm the system from gaining governance power, right? So what you then get is that you get stronger governance with the bad actors cut out of the system. And you also get a, like a significant MKR burn, right? So you get a significant reduction in total supply, which then makes up for all the friction that 
having to go through this whole process costs you, right? And the same dynamic also actually exists for someone who abuses in the first place its power to do an emergency shutdown, right? So if someone goes and kind of like, let's have some fun and shut the whole thing down because it's quite easy to do. The the barrier for, for doing that is still initially, for instance, 50K MKR, right? So it is still, which will then not be honored in the new deployment if it was purely a troll attack. And then again, you have this dynamic where, yeah, like the attacker did manage to shut the system down, but there was a smooth transition to a new system and it cost them a ton of money and that money actually went to MKR Aldous. So who, who decides whether a shutdown was in fact a troll attack or whether a proposal was malicious because there, there could have been just a bug in it or the people honestly thought that uh, the, the system was under attack. So who actually determines whether to penalize um, maker holders or not? So it's, it's, it's quite a complex uh, question really, right? A quite a complex issue, right? But the basic answer is that the community decides, right? Because, because anyone can deploy a maker system at any point in time, right? Because the code is open source. You could actually very easily imagine that immediately after an emergency shutdown, there might be four or 10 or like a thousand new deployments, right? And everyone's saying, this is my, you know, all super awesome deployment, right? Where I haven't, you know, and then maybe, I mean, there might be people trying to like give themselves extra MKR or there might be people to trying to like cut out MKR of, of people they don't like or something, right? And the question is, which new MKR distribution is able to basically, um, you know, get the faith of the overall community and the economic majority of the of the ecosystem, right? And in most cases, like in, in clear-cut cases, such as someone blatantly attacking the system, it's really obvious that you have this, I mean, you essentially have the, like a governance convention, or you could even call it a social convention, that if you try to attack the system, you don't deserve your care, right? And, and there, there's a good reason to migrate to a system that doesn't include MKR holders that have proven that they're malicious to the system, right? So it really comes down to like the dynamics of what do the users of the system think is best for them when, they, when they're picking what system to migrate to. And that's also actually, and not, like that is actually like one of the, maybe the most fundamental point of maker governance, right? Because that is the point where you actually see that the power of MKR holders isn't infinite. They don't actually decide everything. Like they kind of run the system on a day-to-day -day basis until the moment that a very significant event happens, right? Until it, like to the point where the governance has to kind of like fracture and, and reassemble itself. And then what happens is the power actually falls back to the economic participants themselves and MKR holders become totally powerless. And the only thing they can do is kind of like point to their past actions and say, hey, I was so good at governing the system, right? So I should totally be a part of the new deployment. So what's the worst thing that they could get away with? So could they, for example steal all the collateral by like setting the stability to 100%, stability fee to 100% and like get away with that? Like what would be the potential reward that they could get away with with an attack? Like if there was no response from the community? Yeah, sure. it could actually sure. be anything. Like it could be printing, like, I mean, the system is like, because the system completely relies on this dynamic of, uh, you know, triggering an emergency shutdown within the time frame allotted by the, the governance security module, like, because it would be impossible regardless. Like, so there's no attempt to kind of like restrict what kind of technical access governance theoretically has, right? The question is, is that outcome ultimately going to be better for like the average user and the average MK holder in the system, right? And anything that isn't following the, the regular governance process, right? So like actually trying to scientifically optimize the system and following the consensus of the community, is always going to make people worse off, right? Because it breaks the fundamental social contract. And and so this dynamic of like a blatant attack also works on sort of smaller levels, right? Because the, you know, it's not just that, it's not just a dynamic where, you know, you want to protect the system, right? Like you want to like from, from very powerful attacks. You also actually want to kind of like police and 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 try to catch people from breaking the the social contract and sort of catch them in the in an act of doing something where this is a situation where the users most likely wouldn't ex like will most likely actually consider this behavior like like uh, negligent or malicious to them and as a result migrate to a system where this actor the the care of this actor isn't included because that's then you have this very strong dynamic right where people have to be very careful about like carelessly 
trying to push some proposal through that could actually get the whole system shut down and maybe even get them penalized for being responsible for it. Cool. So there are two very significant updates um, coming uh, to the maker system soon. Uh, the first one is the interest generating die. Can you talk about what that is and uh, what made you roll that out? Yeah, so the die savings rate, which is what allows you to hold die and actually get a, like, get a savings return on it as you hold it in your wallet, for instance, is a really fundamental feature because it's kind of the counterpart to the stability fee, right? So right now when the system is balanced, you have like, you can only change the stability fee and then you can modify the supply. And then the downside of that is that that means that when the system really grows, but the supply grows more than the demand, your only option is to pull down on supply. So you kind of have to let the system become a, a victim of its own success, right? And, and artificially restrain the growth of the system, which is what's happening right now where the interest, like the, the stability fee is just incredibly high, right? And it's actually really, yeah, it is kind of crazy. A lot of people commenting, with, you know, why are people even generating die when the fee is just that crazy high, right? And it's amazing to see that people still are using it. But the problem is that, um, that the, the system has no way to spur die demand, right? There's no way to kind of like make it more attractive to hold die. And that's what the die savings rate solves. So instead of just pulling down on the stability fee side when the system is growing, uh, you can pull up on the demand side as well, right? So if you have like the mismatch like this, you can pull it into sync like here and actually see overall growth of the system. The actual effect of that in practice could very well be quite... Uh, you know, quite a, a quantum leap in terms of hitting some sweet spots in, in product market fit where the system suddenly becomes interesting to a lot more people, right? Because on one hand, you get you get the, the, the CDP functionality, which is right now incredibly popular, even with these ridiculously high fees. You can get that down, like you can, well, rather, you get the, because you can, you can get that down to a much lower rate because you can now suddenly make DAI incredibly attractive, right? Because with a stability fee of 20 Twenty percent, for instance, on on uh, generating die. Theoretically, and I mean this is a this is an edge case. Like it wasn't wouldn't actually happen, right? But theoretically, there is at twenty percent. Like there is sort of twenty percent available to give to die holders, right? So imagine if holding die gave you a twenty percent return, and this was without any additional risk whatsoever, right? It was just like holding a regular die, like it just gave you this massive return, right? You would immediately see tons of people moving their, their savings into this because they would want to take advantage of that very high savings rate. Quick question about this though, like yeah. about how this works. Um, doesn't Isn't the stability fee paid in MKR uh, and then the uh, die savings rate would be accumulated in die? How does that work, the transition from the stability fee from MKR, does it have to go through some exchange or something to be paid out? The feature of of the fee being paid directly in MKR and single who that will die is it's kind of one of the, the features that were in the end not done for any uh, like business reason or any any sort of user facing reason, but rather because it was easier to implement. So it was easier to get single that will die done and get the get the, the the you know the system live and rolling. And sort of see it play out in in the real world, right? Well, wasn't so, that deflationary aspect of MKR because the fee is burned also important to the economic design? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But the way it's going to be implemented in multilateral DAI is just a more like a more sound, like a better approach overall, right? Which is that the system takes in fees and DAI, and then what it does is it accumulates kind of a, a pool of DAI called the buffer. And when the buffer hits a certain size, it triggers what's called a surplus surplus auction. And the surplus auction is then where the MKR is burned. And then what that means is that buffer is also available as kind of like an account where die can also be taken out of and put into the die savings rate, for instance. Um, and actually, uh, today you can also pay the stability fee on a CDP with die because it is actually super frustrating and was one of the biggest concerns all the users had that they had to like go and, you know, they had to use ETH to open a CDP and then they get DAI, the second token, and then they also have to go and get a third token, like some dust, MKR dust, right, to then pay the fee to retrieve their collateral out of it, right? And it's just like incredibly, you know, user unfriendly, really. And as a result, the feature to pay the stability fee with DAI was added to the front end and kind of like means that it takes care of it automatically to go and buy MKR on an exchange and then uh, pay the stability fee for you. But that 
that uh, convenience functionality is moved into the core of Maker in, in multi-collateral die. So the release that that also supports the die savings rate and is then fundamental to facilitating the um, the die savings rate and the flows of money that that really go from, from CDP holders paying the stability fee, right? And then a part of that going to die holders and another part of it going to care holders. What happens if people don't actually... Um use the stability fee and so you know you promise the uh the locked die uh this interest rate but then it turns out there's not enough people actually you know closing their cdp and so this you don't actually have the money like isn't there a liquidity concern here like you know what happens if you don't have the money to actually pay out the interest rates that were promised yeah there would be if it used the current model where you pay all the fee at when you close the cp but in the next version of the system, the accounting is continuous. So you actually see the die, like rather than a CDP accruing, uh, you could say uh, like a fee over time, right? This still sits there and has to be paid. What a CDP does in multi die is it actually continuously generates more and more die. So it doesn't kind of like accumulate a fee you have to pay. It just generates die on your behalf that it then sends to the buffer. So what that means is that it's just like the direct, like when the DSR pays out, that die has been directly generated out of the CDPs at that moment in time. So there's always like real-time solvency in the system, right? Because of course that's necessary or you could run into these weird edge cases. That sounds like a very major upgrade. One thing I'm curious about, so in my understanding, to actually gen have your die generate interest, you have to put it in a, in a particular smart contract and only then does it, does it um, generate interest. Why was that design decision made? Why don't you just um, have all die in existence um, generate um, interest or at least um, have a tokenized claim um, against that die in that uh, smart contract similar to what Compound is doing with C die um, because th th that would let people not just have die sitting there, but also let them be able to use it in depths. Yeah, so the, really, the, the short answer is that it's for the sake of uh, like user friendliness, because while it sounds great to always have um, like a, a DSR accumulating, there might be many situations where, for instance, if you're trying to write a small app or you're trying to like create a smart contract or you're sending some amount or you like there, there could be a lot of situations where you don't, you know, you just need to send an exact amount of money, and you don't really care about getting some small savings for for like let's say a couple of days or a couple of hours or something. Right. Also, the, I feel that there might be an issue here. You know, just you know, we've ex had issues like this in design of Cosmos as well, where it's like you don't want to iterate over all die holders every single time you want to pay out interest, and the problem is. You know, okay, maybe you can pick it. So you add it to a pool, and what actually happens is die holders have shares in a pool. But then the problem is, then die is not stable anymore. That that defeated the whole point of what we were trying to do with creating the stable coin. So I, I, I'm not sure how it would actually be possible to have it go to all die holders in a computationally efficient way. And there are a lot of use cases where currently you're locking up die. So for instance, say you'll use it in a prediction market as collateral, for instance, um, and you really want it to be in, a, uh, to be, to be generating interest. And don't you kind of push people into compound and into using compound die for this instead of uh, interest generating die? Yeah, I mean, that, that would be a, that, that could totally be a concern, but. The, th the thing is that it is actually implemented in a way where that is completely possible. So you would see, it, you know, you would see, let's say, the prediction market implement on their end the, the, like an integration where the moment you deposit DAI onto the platform, it's automatically sent into earning the DAI savings rate. And on top of that, it is even technically possible to create this concept of the, of the um, you know, the C DAI with the DSR, where you actually can use the DAI directly in the DSR as tokens. And uh, the long-term vision is, in fact, that like one day far out in the future, right, when the ecosystem is way more mature and uh, the you know the standards are, are are able to handle this and kind of like the accounting systems and even the accountants can sort of wrap their heads around it, you would have all die in real time, always generate the savings rate, right? Because rationally, there's no reason to do it if it's if there's no friction in doing it. But the fact is just that today, if you try to force it on people, it would. Like it would create more losses through friction and confusion that it would create, like then it would sort of, you know, create the gains of like, let's say, um, 
you know, like when you're sending die to your friend, instead of like pulling it out of the die savings rate, sending it to him, and then a day later he puts it into the die savings rate, right? Like, sure, you can you can save uh, you can save like, or you can sort of gain one day extra of interest earned by just sending it directly. But the problem is that what you then create is like a, a much bigger burden on the wallets to properly uh, imp- integrate and implement this. So um, that's really, that's the big trade-off in the beginning, right? That is actually simpler technically to deal with kind of this fixed idea of the die savings rate where you deposit your die into and you pull it out when you then want to send it around rather than you always have to account for the the um, the savings rate accumulating. Because it is actually, it is, it is implemented in exactly the way um, you know, um, you described, right? That it is this, it is a share in like a pool. I mean, that's a very rough and like very simplified explanation of it, right? But it's like, it's, it's, it on the back end, it doesn't actually change over time, but the front end kind of updates the value. So it looks like it's kind of like a transaction that's happening, right? But in reality, it's really just kind of like numbers that's, modified in in you know various ways right which is exactly actually how the stability fee works right now so the stability fee doesn't actually update individually on every cdp it just looks that way and in reality it's a single uh, number called the accumulator that's that's updating and then it's displayed across all cdps when it gets updated do you think that over time that you know currently what what maker dow essentially is is this like decentralized cent- central bank, right? A decentral bank. Do you think that over time, maybe there might be competitor uh, decentral banks that uh, kind of compete with the maker system? And, you know, maybe they, they claim that their gov- whatever their governance processes that they use might be more better than what the MakerDAO system does. I think this is actually kind of what the Libra project from Facebook is kind of going down that route a little bit. And so how do you think the maker ecosystem will react uh, to alternative uh, decentral bank stablecoin designs, whether that's, you know, a copy of the maker system with, you know, a different governance system or, you know, even uh, a different system altogether, kind of more like the reserve system, which uses, um, you know, slightly different mechanics. Yeah, I, I always expected that we would see like copycats and competitors and similar types of systems much earlier, right? And it would really be this like big space and, and there would be just like a lot of different versions all competing. Uh, and it's quite interesting that the reality ended up being that Maker pretty much became the only decentralized stablecoin with decentralized governance. And then the whole ecosystem of centralized stablecoins was what ended up completely exploding. Um, but you're totally right that like the, the way that, like the thing that, that makes MakerDAO unique is a decentralized governance. And the way that you would sort of have something that would actually be a competitor and that would actually operate in the same space as Maker would be by having a, a different type of decentralized governance that could somehow add, add more to the table, right? And be more efficient or, or better at managing risk or something like that. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think that so far there's there's really nothing like it yet. I mean, there's no attempt at actually creating this type of of self-organizing and self-sustainable community that that we are trying to bootstrap, right? And if you look at something like Libra, for instance, I, I would say that it, like it is actually quite different. So based on my my uh, not totally perfect understanding of Libra, it has a a bit more of kind of like a, a fixed um, like a monetary policy where it's kind of like predefined and based on the individual actions of of the the participants in the in the ecosystem. So they're not really they don't have the same like it prioritizes liquidity, as I see it, but it uh, what it what it sacrifices is kind of like a coherent and unified monetary policy. So you end up having a that you end up having a collateral portfolio, and you end up having an inflation rate and a and a pick that's a little bit more random because you're prioritizing this ability for anyone to always create them by with you know by pledging collateral into a system without any sort of framework to do that within. And that's what I think, I mean, ultimately, I think that's what is by far the most powerful, right? Because that's what also what, you know, thousands of years of traditional finance coalesced at, right? And what you need to then do to, to make something that's better than Maker is you need to get better at still playing, you know, like creating, like 
like operating within that framework and kind of like setting that framework correctly so that you do get this like optimal liquidity, optimal uh, peg point, right? Optimal inflation and uh, best risk management. The question is whether you can kind of like innovate on top of this idea of having token holders ultimately curating the decisions, right? Uh, maybe there's something like paying for votes or like paying for like or, or, or rewarding activity or paying experts or something. And all of these ideas is actually also something that maker governance is very heavily focused on trying to innovate, right? Because of course, this is only the very beginning of decentralized governance. Let's fast forward maybe five or 10 years. So you just added um, six tokens for multi-collateral DAI. The choice of tokens or the move to add exactly six tokens makes me think this is the first of many Uh, additions to come. Uh, so basically, if you look at the market cap of the six tokens that you are adding, um, they're only on the order of a few percent of what the Ethereum market cap is. So the collateral that was already available, the last version of the system that was technically much simpler. What are your plans for expanding the scope of collateral um, in five years? Will I be able to um, use my house as collateral on, uh, on Maker? Yeah, the short answer is that, uh, yes, that would absolutely be the, the dream, right? That where the project is going is that it's kind of trying to break beyond the boundaries of blockchain and crypto. And uh, just got, like, I mean, to some extent, the bubble that crypto still lives within, right? But instead, try to reach out to the real world and integrate with the real financial system, the real global trading system um, and most importantly, have real assets and real value in the real world actually back die, right? So it's not just hot crypto air, but it's, I mean, which actually does have its own and very unique benefits and very unique risk characteristics, right? But ultimately, you want as much diversification and you want as much kind of like, pers like as many different perspectives and avenues of, of stability as you possibly can behind a, a stable coin, right? Um, so, and, and there is actually some, incredibly exciting and, and uh, quite a fast moving innovation happening exactly within the space of like figuring out how do you, how we do we make it so that you know five years is maybe a little bit optimistic right but potentially five years from now you can kind of like open an app on your phone and then you click a button and that app uses some sort of third party uh, service to legally connect the ownership and the deed of your house to a token which is then directly set to some sort of automatic or automated, uh, you know, risk assessment function that's connected to Maker that kind of like does a, an, an assessment of your house and the value of your house and the risk associated with that house. And then ultimately creates a new CDP type unique to you and kind of like your house and your the risk parameters and your sort of uh, conditions as a, as a debtor, right? Um, and then ultimately you can deposit that token again with a single click on your app into Maker directly and generate DAI directly and go and, you know, like, re well, maybe refinance your current loan or something like that with it, right? I mean, that is certainly like very cyberpunk and very, um, like a really cool and like very a concrete way that you could think, like you could actually imagine that, you know, the mom and pop pops of, of the future would like have blockchain directly in their face because that's how they would do their, you know, their mortgages, right? But of course, the steps along that way are most likely going to be a lot more about kind of integrating on the back end of existing financial infrastructures, right? So it's a tough uh, stretch to take it to the end user and really make it like usable and accessible and, 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 and uh, powerful for the, the sort of the regular, you know, retail credit seeker, right? But it's a lot easier if you start trying to implement it to something like large scale trade finance or even just like large scale Uh, securities or bonds repo markets because there's so much like institutional capture and like lock-in of the platforms right now in those spaces and there's so much I mean really like paperwork and bureaucracy and just like old thinking around it that it's it's you know it, it's it's incredibly ripe for disruption by uh, by just modern technology maybe let's end on this very cyberpunk notion. I think those are fantastic closing words. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, this was super interesting. And I apologize to our listeners for going over a little bit. I hope uh, you're all still here. Yeah, sorry, that 
that happens quite often for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the nature of Maker being so complicated. <laughs> Thank you. But thanks a lot for the great questions and uh, the great conversation. Cool. Thank you guys for listening and uh, tune in next week. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.